I've always loved water. I think it's something deep inside of us. That's one of the essentials of life. The salt water, the oceans represent travel and, and freedom and, and exploration and, and mystery. Especially when you're a teenager, which is when my romance with sailing began. Take it three, two, one, take it. Get in, Larry. You clear them. Get in. Give it up, Larry. It's a fine line between romance and obsession. No shame in either emotion. But obsession turns desires into longings, dreams into quests. And in sailing, the ultimate quest is the America's Cup. It is a race sailed across tides and generations with the oldest trophy in international sport at stake. The passion it inspires is part patriotism, part personal pride. It is the ultimate challenge to man's ingenuity. It calls upon men to harness the power of the wind to conquer the sea and an able competitor to win a trophy that was first awarded over 150 years ago. The America's Cup match consists of two boats sailing to win two out of three races, winner take all. No holds barred on technology. Whatever modern know-how allows is the only limit. In the year 2003, the cup was won by a Swiss team called Alinghi, led by Ernesto Battarelli. This is the story of a challenge to reclaim the cup by a team brought together and united in that purpose by Larry Ellison. And representing your country in, in an international sporting event? I get chills just talking about it. We're not BMW Oracle Racing. We're the American team. It was a quest that I started 10 years before. I thought about building the best possible team we could build, building the fastest possible boat we could build, and seeing if we could bring the America's Cup back to America. I enjoy discovering my own limits. I enjoy learning the limits of different technologies. I mean, how fast can we make this boat go? You learn a lot about yourself when you compete. This is the X version of the America's Cup. This is extreme sailing. It's a stunning piece of engineering, and it's the limits of what's possible in sailing in the 21st century. And it's very exciting to be a part of it. For sure, the boats are going to be the stars of this cup. We'll probably never see something like this again, you know, not in, not in our lifetimes. Larry Ellison is a college dropout. 
Ernesto Battavelli, Harvard Business School. It's like a heavyweight championship fight where the fighters don't like each other very much. Larry Ellison said the BMW Oracle sailing team is much better than yours. <laughs> it's quite, uh, it's quite funny, coming from Larry Ellison, who's uh, never made it to the final of the America's Cup. Ellison, self-made. Bertarelli, born into wealth. He inherited his money. I wasn't so lucky. <laughs> I wish I inherited a lot of money. Bigger. I wish everyone inherits a lot of money. Yeah, Why not? They both spent hundreds of millions of dollars to prepare for the race. Does he want to come and help his boat so we find out who's best? In 2003, I was with Alinghi and sailing with Ernesto Bertarelli. I was the helmsman. When we won the America's Cup, Larry Allison actually came up and congratulated us. He was gracious. Ernesto actually said to him, hey, Larry, why don't we do a race in San Francisco? And, you know, why don't we drive? And I can remember thinking, I don't think this is a great idea, but anyway. We brought um, Swiss 64, which was the boat that won the America's Cup, and uh, raced it against their boat. And um, Larry won. They had a second race in, in Newport, and the same thing happened. It was no surprise um, to any of us. What is he going to do if he loses? Is he going to continue to go to court? Ernesto Battarelli, as the defender of the cup, set the rules for this, the 33rd edition. At the end of the regatta here in Valencia that took place in 06, 07, Ernesto took the rules and just tore them up. Battarelli set out to create a regatta for his America's Cup defense that only he could win. He picked an illegal venue the umpires worked for him, and he reserved the right to change the rules whenever he saw fit. It was a sham, and most of the rest of the sailing world were pretty offended by this. And I talked to him on the phone and said, Ernesto, why are you doing this? And he said, Larry, wouldn't you do this if you'd won the cup? Wouldn't you like a set of rules like this? My answer was, no, I, I really don't think I would feel good about winning if I couldn't lose. Once friends, after 15 court cases, 14 of which were won by Ellison and BMW Oracle, they became bitter do-or-die adversaries. It sort of seems like there's, you know, there's been this ongoing argument and dispute between our peers, but, you know, finally, it's a battle on the water. It's just between you and him. Yeah, and may the best team win. The site of this America's Cup, Valencia, Spain, was established by the Romans in 138 BC. Its history thereafter is a series of conquests and submissions, occupations and periods of prosperity and peace. In far less time, Ellison and Bertarelli wrote a history every bit as contentious as that Roman era. They quarreled and competed until finally they sought the ultimate judgment that a better boat and a backing wind can bring on the high seas. When I was very young, I read a series of articles by Robin Lee Graham. Uh, he was a 16-year-old whose parents let him sail around the world in a 24-foot boat, and I, uh, I tried to convince my parents to let me do the same. The problem was I just couldn't afford the 24-foot boat. It was a very romantic idea. You could see all four corners of the globe in a little tiny sailboat that almost anyone could afford. Larry Ellison was born in 1944 to an unwed mother who gave him to his aunt and uncle in Chicago to raise. They became his adoptive parents and he grew up in a struggling household. But enchantment with the ocean 
and sailing were the constants in the complex equation that has been Ellison's life. I was in love with the sea. The first job I ever had was a lifeguard uh, on the beaches of Lake Michigan working for the city of Chicago. Beyond the economic hardship, there was a father who drilled into him that he would never amount to much. Ellison left Chicago after a few attempts at college and went to California in the 60s to try his hand at computer programming. His early years in the Golden State included rock climbing in Yosemite Park, a first marriage that ended in divorce, and sailing, hours and hours of it, on the San Francisco Bay. The first boat I ever bought was an Islander 24, which uh, was right at the limit of my economic capabilities. In fact, beyond the limit of my economic capabilities, finally became either me or the boat. I was living on the boat in Berkeley Marina. I couldn't afford an apartment. Uh, eventually, it was the boat or, or food, and at that point, I had to give up the boat. Still, the sea constantly called. The romance never relented. Brad Webb, New Zealand, Bowman. Dirk Dorita, Netherlands. Larry Ellison's crew for the 33rd America's Cup was a hand-picked team of the best sailors from around the world. John Kostecki, USA. All of them professional, blue-collar seamen who drift from one corner of the globe to another trying to harness the wind aboard a winning boat. Little Australia, skipper and helmsman. <laughs> Russell Coots, New Zealand, afterguard. Three-time America's Cup winner, Russell Coots, was a primary source of tension between the two owners. If you want to win the America's Cup, I suggest you hire Russell Coots. His, his record's not too bad. He's been in three of them and won them all. Russell won a cup for Bertarelli's Swiss team, Alinghi, in 2003. However, he left to join the BMW Oracle team, led by Larry Ellison. There was a falling out between uh, you know, Ernesto and I. We had a, a difference of opinion on a range of issues. After Russell Coots won him the cup, Ernesto refused to pay him. Russell had to go to court in Switzerland to get paid. Did your friendship with Larry basically start to fall apart when he, when he hired Russell Coots? Possibly. You should ask him. You guys used to be pretty good friends, didn't you? Yeah, we got along very well. Mm -hmm. Do you know what happened or why? Yeah, when I hired, hired Russell Coots, he, he was afraid he was going to lose. Coots, whose place in sailing history was already secure, was engaged to diminish one man's sailing legacy while enhancing another's. And Larry Ellison, USA, after guard. I'm just sitting here totally stressed out. For a <laughs> reason? Just, uh, oh, I don't know. I don't know. That, that, this, this boat race, this boat race, you know, where, you know, it's, it's um, to some degree in the hand of the wind gods, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of a cruel fate that luck plays a part. So much of life rides on the crest of an uncertain wave. Our control. Our power to make our own way is always at the mercy of higher forces at fate's command. For me, you know, it's a, a dream come true to be racing in the America's Cup. Um, I've been quite fortunate to have been successful in a lot of other aspects of our sport, but unfortunately I've never won the America's Cup, so I'm pretty keen to uh, race and hopefully win. Uh, every now and then I have to pinch myself um, because we are so lucky to be doing exactly, you know, the, the thing that we, we love to do. This happens once in a lifetime, I think, one of these projects, so it's, it's, it's very privileged to be part of it.
We're on the countdown to the start of race one. At the start of a match race, the two boats jockey for position before crossing the starting line. The right of way belongs to the boat with the wind to its right. In this case, USA 17. Look at the power on that. Just before they crossed the line, skipper Jimmy Spithill positioned USA 17. Ernesto had difficulty. Jimmy came in right on time, aimed right at him. So she had to change wow. course. Wow, first contact. To avoid a collision, so thus assuring a lingi was penalized. They were caught in their heels a bit. They weren't expecting it. It's a penalty against the Linky. Can you believe it? That was aggression right from the start. The experts all agreed that the start would be crucial. But the race hadn't even begun, and already. USA 17 had an edge. Coming down to the final 20 seconds. 20! 20 seconds. BMW Oracle have made a mistake here. They're going slow and backwards, PJ. BMW Oracle look to be stalled as we're coming down to the final 10 seconds. We broke one of our winches. And we ended up stuck and unable to sail the boat. In the meantime, they got back down, were able to cross the line and, and, and start on time. James Spithill made a mistake. He got the boat stalled. If you look at the two mistakes in that start, one was the penalty from them, and one was us getting stuck. And that may be one of the weaknesses of the wing. BMW Oracle Racing are playing catch up big time. Oh, they were stuck in the putty. They just could not get going. That's a lingy in the distance taking off. Now BMW Oracle gets back behind the line, conceding an awful lot of distance. Slowly clear up there, coming up and going okay. So we started the first race 660 meters behind them. Well, USA 17 is wound up. USA 17, 113 feet of carbon fiber, finally knifing through the waves. Its wing sail, 23 stories high, in hot pursuit. And Lingi still have a decent lead, but I think it's being chewed into here, PJ. At the, at the start, a Lingi led BMW Oracle when they recrossed the line by 660 meters. It is currently 435, coming down, 430. Nobody's talking about it. Brian, keep up if you can. The wing sail is generating so much lift and so much forward momentum. The fastest sailboat ever made. USA 17 can reach speeds over 50 miles an hour and sail up to three times the speed of the wind. A boat designed to approach perfection and surpass the future. Racing for the oldest sporting trophy in the world. In 1851, Queen Victoria's husband, Prince Albert, had the first ever World's Fair and invited the nations of the world to send their best examples of technology, including yachts, because in those days, that's how you got the goods to market. So they decided to have a race of all nations. The only country to send a boat was the United States. The New York Yacht Club put together the Yacht America, and raced 13 British vessels around the Isle of Wight and won the race by such a distance, Queen Victoria is reputed to have asked her footman, who is first? And the footman said, it's the Yacht America, Your Majesty. Well, who is second? Your Majesty, there is no second. Because the second place boat was so far behind, they couldn't really even see who it was. The 
there's no doubt about it, BMW Oracle is closing in. USA is continually going a little bit faster. Yet, with the deficit they started with, there's a lot of racing to be done yet. And we have to remember, 20 miles upwind and 20 miles downwind. We're passing him now! Woo! Pass him now! The imperative is to work together as a team. Yet, Ernesto Bertarelli chose to drive his own boat, which he'd never before done in an America's Cup. While Larry Ellison put team first, swallowed his pride, and stepped aside for another helmsman. And checking! It was a selfless act, given Ellison's five world championships and winning record in professional match racing. Likewise for team leader Russell Coots, it was painful to give up the helm of USA 17, since he had skippered three winning America's Cup teams before. Larry and I, both decided that um, uh, James Spittle, Jimmy, was the best one to drive the boat. Uh, obviously, you know, he'd done the most preparation, the most sailing, and he's, a, he's, you know, I think he's the world's best helmsman right now. He's that good. Jimmy, at 30 years old, is in his fourth America's Cup. Uh, two years ago, I was racing in the professional match race circuit against Jimmy, and I had my best year ever as, as, as a pro. I came second in the professional match race circuit, way, way behind this young kid. As with all great performers, the nuances of Jimmy's skills were nurtured in childhood, in his case, on a tiny island off the coast of Sydney, Australia. And I grew up where the only access to, to get anywhere was by boat. To go to school, we had to go by boat. As we got older, you'd try and get a lift off a mate, or you could, you'd be racing your mate. You know, that was the big competition, really, to, to race to the school. Often we turn up to school completely wet from racing each other and uh, having a bit of fun on the way. He had not lost a race all year on the RC44 Pro Match Race Circuit until it's in Cagliari, Italy. I beat him. And it was one of the great days in my life. History on the Mediterranean today. Race one of America's Cup 33. And for the first time, multi-hulls contesting. Sailing's illustrious prize. I think they're attacking, uh, BMW Oracle attacking. They're rolling the jib up. They might actually be faster and point higher without the jib. Well, they've come from 660 metres behind at the start. Now they are 408, 409, 410 in front. BMW Oracle's design, More breeze coming now. the most technologically advanced in sailing history. Powered by a hard wing sail comprised of two pieces which shift and align according to signals from a computer, relaying wind speed and direction human ingenuity, defying the will of the wind gods. It's the largest wing that's ever been built. It's larger than the wing span of a 747. The sheer bloody mindedness of it. The fact that Russell calls Larry up and says, you know what, we want to build a wing. But my goodness, the scale of it is breathtaking. 
Innovation has always been as important to the America's Cup as sailing skill. But America does not hold an exclusive claim to the edge of technology. In 1983, the Australians shocked the sailing world by snapping America's 132-year stranglehold on the cup. They did it with their top secret winged keel, technology that the Americans would refine to take back the cup four years later. So that is the mark they're heading to, just down on the left. Here we come to the end of leg number one. And it's BMW Oracle leading a lingi. Oh, yeah. Look at that. Oh, yeah. Put your book tag, eh? Put your... Oh, yeah. Look at that guy. As they're on the downhill slide... That's your average for the next minute. ...to the finish. 20 nautical miles away. America's Cup 33, Defender Alinghi. Skipper by Ernesto Bellarelli. Around the top mark. At 3 minutes 21 astern of BMW Oracle. Ernesto Bertarelli's bravado remained in full force. He still had not given up the wheel to a more experienced helmsman. Excess pride, perhaps. Was he chasing a better boat? Too soon to tell. So the question now is, can Alinghi get back into this first race? Right now, BMW Oracle is going 25 knots. Alinghi, 17 knots. That rubber band is just stretching out. Up on a 10-2. Still a little twisted here, Jimmy, and slightly under camber. I'm happy with that. Right now, we're lower track by about five degrees. BMW Oracle are flying both hulls, and I tell you, they'd fly all three if they could. That wing is a weapon. Wind looks quite strong along the beach. Yeah, this is going to be a little bit lighter up ahead. You're We're 3,300 and something metres ahead. Boat's going nicely. The America's Cup 33, race one, the finish. BMW Oracle beats Alinghi in the long-awaited, much-heralded clash of these multi-hull giants. And now the signal the BMW Oracle has beaten Alinghi by over 3,500 metres. America's Cup. The victory was total. The statement direct. Larry Ellison and crew understood just how devastating the win had been. But their celebration was subdued when the finish line was crossed. Confidence was high, but the cup was not yet theirs. They were fast today, and uh, uh, the wing seem, seems to be uh, quite a weapon. Big changes to make or tweaks? Well, I don't think we're going to be able to build a wing from now till uh, Sunday. So that's not going to happen. Um, but we have uh, a number of uh, tools that we, we can use. We have a number set of boards we can use. We have different sails. Um, we can uh, maybe use, uh, you know, some of the things that we use to, uh, to make the boat go fast differently. And uh, we'll, we'll see. We have a day to think about it. My question is for Brad. You have often stated that uh, the America's Cup is a design race. Do you think today that uh, Alinghi has failed in the design? <laughs> <laughs> what do you want? What do you want me to say, mate? 
<laughs> they sailed from behind us in front of us. <laughs> Did you see what happened? Oh, OK. Well, then you, you can work it out. I think we all need to remember that um, this next race, the triangular course, is, the, is, what, is a race that we absolutely have to win. Everything that's come together for today needs to happen again for the, for the next race. And we need to treble check all the equipment because a gear failure will result in a loss. This series is not all over and we have respect for the other team. So I think um, for those, I'm going to have a uh, one beer, maybe two, <laughs> after this. You're all welcome to, uh, to join me in that. But remember, the task isn't over yet. Race two. A great deal hung in the balance on this February morning. Alinghi's prospects to host the cup again, the self-respect of their team, and the long-held bragging rights of the only European to ever win the cup. Also at stake, however, was the fulfillment of an American's 10-year pursuit, fueled by the memories of two failed attempts. Larry Ellison was not about to let up. I really hate losing. Ladies and gentlemen, the of your When we lost those two America's Cups, the clarity of the loss was, was very painful. That hurt. It's a question of who's going to blink first. They must be confident. There can only one side favoured. The end of the Oracle have got the pedal down. They've got the Tower of Power working as best they can. Here is USA, skipper by Jimmy Spittle, with Larry Ellison and Russell Coots on board. And it was freezing. We're hitting 30 knots in very, very cold weather. But no one notices. Everyone's focused on doing their job. I was just, you know, again, watching Alinghi and, and, and telling, telling Jimmy and Cheese and the other, the other guys in the boat how we were doing relative to the other boat. Just so you guys know, we're destroying the baby day too. That's Ernesto Bitterelli on the helm. Behind him, Brad Butterworth. I think when we all saw that Ernesto was driving, everyone thought that that was great, you know, on our team. We felt it, and frankly, the difference in helming abilities really showed, and it was obvious for the world to see. But still, the advantage is with BMW Oracle. Ernesto didn't drive after about the first 15 minutes. Got a new helmsman, Louis Perron from France, has taken over the helm. Things had gone so badly in that first 15 minutes that I, I think he gave up. BMW Oracle have gone very soft indeed. Right at the start, we let Alenghi have the right-hand side of the race course. We separated more from them, I think, than we should have. We thought we had a much faster boat. In fact, we knew we had a much faster boat. We never should have let him get that separation. Here they come together. This is going to be the first cross. I think this is going to be real close. I, I think Alenghi may be ahead here. They had more wind. We have got a boat race on our hands here, folks. They picked up more than a kilometer. And the more wind you have, the faster you go. And Alinghi are right wound up into New Breeze. Uh, certainly Alinghi has found an extra couple of cylinders. They must have put some real power in the boat today. They're sailing beautifully. Alinghi, with her new helmsman, came from behind, overtook USA 17, and moved out to a 300-meter lead which eventually stretched to 600 meters. Big, big gains to Alinghi. Mateo, I'm a bearing 205. BMW Oracle, are they, are they attacking? It looks like they might, a BMW Oracle attacking. Uh, 
a Lingy on starboard, BMW Oracle racing on port. They're coming together. Jimmy, just don't be slow in the slip. So take it if and down, go slightly fast. Okay, let's take it. JK and Matteo put us right where we wanted to be in the ley line from a long way out, you know, which is pretty difficult to do. Kick as you can, guys. Kick as you can. Got to go, OK? Go, 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 go. You know, it really put them in a tough spot. 60 metre advantage to Elingi, and it's dropping fast. <laughs> USA over 20 knots. <laughs> Remember, they're heading to the top mark. <laughs> Just 20 metre advantage to Elingi. This is incredible the pace these two boats are coming to add each other. Here comes the tank now from Alinghi 5. How long will it take before they fire up? Meanwhile... Painfully slow. Alinghi have let BMW Oracle get inside them at the windward mark. BMW Oracle look to be in front at the moment. BMW Oracle USA has regained the lead after leading early on in leg one and then Alinghi dominating for most of the first leg. Mark one, race two, America's Cup 33 out of Valencia, Spain. And USA, skippered by Jimmy Spittle for BMW Oracle Racing, is leading with two legs to go. We got the next pressure line coming in about 15 or less. But there's probably only five or ten bow lengths in it. That's your average pressure. It is very close. One. One mistake on BMW Oracle, and they'll give a chance to Alinghi. Both boats were redlining the whole time. As BMW Oracle has hit 33 knots. The boats were so extreme. It was really all sort of knife edge that we were sailing. But look, when you get to the racing, that's that's usually what happens. And as you know, sailors, you have to decide how much you, you're going to push that. The lighter, the faster is the design mantra for the men who build these boats. But as with every human pursuit where speed is the goal, the path to reach it is lined with risk. Risk in sailing can mean the difference between winning and losing, or life and death on the ocean. The Sydney Hobart race, it is the most demanding ocean race in the world. I'm going to start the boat, and uh, of course, if I, get, if I get into any trouble, it's going to be pretty crowded out here. You sail from Sydney, the capital of Australia, due south, to the capital of the island of Tasmania called Hobart. They call it the Great Race, and it really is the greatest race, because, you know, it's, it's tough. You never quite know what you're going to get. In Bass Strait, it's a very formidable piece of water. Every living soul aboard the 115 boats that left Sydney Harbour knew the forecast. There would be rough conditions that day, just how rough no one could have imagined. It started to get windier and, you know, we ended up sailing in sustained winds of 80 plus. It's difficult to describe just how big the waves were. 40 foot, 50 foot, 60 foot waves that are breaking in the open ocean. Blue green office buildings coming at us every 30 seconds or so. Worsening weather has now forced 20 yachts to withdraw. The worst of the hurricane hit at night. Working in shifts, the crew either struggled on deck to control the boat or got sick below. In daylight, you'll go over waves in a controlled fashion, but at night, you often go straight over them and then the yacht will slam on the other side of the waves. The sailors of the Sayonara were being tossed around deck like rag dolls. Three suffered broken bones. Mark Turner uh, suddenly came down below with a magic marker making white circles on, on, on the inside of Sinara. 
What are you doing? This is, well, the, this is where the bow's beginning to delaminate. The bow's starting to come off the boat. The bow is coming off the boat? <laughs> That's crazy. By the next morning, they came to realize that their quest for victory had become a struggle for survival. What they didn't know yet is what was happening to the fleet behind them. Mayday, mayday, mayday. It's Winston Churchill, Winston Churchill. We are getting the life rafts on deck. Five yachts sank. Right along the southern coast, it was a day of terror and bravery. One of them, the Winston Churchill. Six men of her nine-man crew were picked up after surviving in the water for over 24 hours. The other three didn't make it. Six people died. 55 people were pulled from the water. Fortunately, none of us, not Sayonara, had to be pulled from the water. This was the test of survival. I mean, you know, you felt your life was at stake because your life was at stake. Sayonara won the race, but there was no joy, no champagne. Only a dazed sense of relief reflected in the hugs on the dock. It was a pretty somber moment. Some of the, you know, the people that were lost were friends of ours. I didn't need to hang around. For me, it was good to go home. Danger has always been an undercurrent connecting Larry Ellison's hobbies. He's flown and driven the fastest jets and cars, broken his neck surfing. All pursuits he continues to this day. But he said to a reporter upon his safe arrival in Tasmania, never again, not if I live to a thousand years old, will I do a Hobart race. Okay, got a little football here, guys. Nice little pressure, USA for BMW Oracle, skipper by Jimmy Spittle, is now over 2,000 metres in front. We've just got to think about the other... Uh, Closing down to the jibe mark. Okay. So that's the mark whistling by. Blink and you miss it. There we go. We're bearing away. Jimmy Spittle's proud parents took in the action from a spectator boat. BMW Oracle are on the final hunt towards the finishing line. They're flying both hulls. Oh, oh, can you believe it? A linky are coming to the jive mark now, but BMW Oracle have shown their pace and power. Oracle have tanked. At one stage, BMW Oracle clocked at doing 33 knots. The big risk here is that BMW Oracle have a catastrophic failure with one of their rigs. Just a little lower course, okay? Max pressure there and holding. Yeah, How close are we to the line? Uh, nine minutes. Someone once asked me if it's worth $100 million to win the America's Cup. And I said, I didn't know, uh, but it's surely not worth $100 million to lose the America's Cup. This is not a poor corner on the south side of Chicago. And there is no father nearby reminding Larry Ellison that its prospects are limited. But the memories of those times have echoed down the years, pushing him to test his limits, filling his heart with a hunger to feel life on every possible level. Physical, spiritual, emotional, personal. It was personal for all of us. It was personal for me. I desperately wanted to win after trying for 10 years. It was personal for Russell, even though he'd won it three times before. 
It was certainly personal for Jimmy. This is his fourth America's Cup, even though he's only 30 years old. Winning changed his life. The 10-year wait was worth it for Edison and all those associated with the effort. In the final minutes of the race, the outcome became a formality and the clinking of champagne flutes replaced the beating of nervous hearts as the dominant sound in the BMW Oracle camp. Little helm change on a Lingy going on right there. Maybe Ernesto is taking back over from Lewick. Ernesto Bertarelli has had his hands firmly on the cup for the last two events, but it looks like his grip is slipping. The power of that wing was awesome. The Lingy have just had no answer. Okay, it's going to be bottom for the next 20 or so, and then a good build back. USA BMW Oracle set to win race two and the America's Cup. Building in five. There is no second place. An expression with two meanings, one literal, one symbolic. As it was used in the first America's Cup in 1851, the phrase literally means that the next best boat is too far back to even consider. But it also means that in competition, in the annals of history, in the game of life, first place is all there is. Hearing a little bit of twist, Jimmy. Yeah, a little fast coming. this team. I'm so proud to be a part of this team, and I'm especially proud to bring the America's Cup once again, after a long absence, back to the United States of America.
than that. Over the last uh, 10 years, anyone who has ever come close to the Alinghi team understands what I feel now. Congratulations um, to the BMW Oracle team. Good victory. Well done, Larry. Well done, Russell. We exit, I believe, with uh, our head eye and uh, proud of uh, our achievement so far. I said, congratulations, you won the America's Cup twice. You should be very proud. I've been in that situation. It's a bit of a shock that suddenly it's over and you lost. Uh, it's, it, losing's brutal. Being a part of a team that doesn't give up and eventually prevails is one of the best feelings you can have in life. Both sailing crews partied all night and swapped stories. One sailor, Larry Ellison, was now the guardian of a 160-year-old tradition. He took a sip out of the cup and took stock of what it meant. Dreams are to pursue. The ocean is there to explore. Limits are there to exceed. And America is where the America's Cup belongs.